Hi, I'm Daniel Ketchum, editor of X-Men Legacy, and I'm here on the phone with Cy Spurrier, the writer of X-Men Legacy. Hello! Uh, so, Cy, Cy, 12 issues of X-Men Legacy. We're on 12. Pretty amazing, right? Um, because we worked together before on stuff like uh, a Ghost Rider annual, an X-Club, um, some, some other X-Men science team one-shots, um, but um, never, we've never worked on anything this extended. 12 issues. Yeah, and it's it's gone amazingly fast. Do you feel the same? I mean, it feels like it was kind of only... Well, it, it kind of was only a few months ago, actually, that we started working on Damn it. Damn you, that's, double shipping. That's the nature of that stuff, right? But, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's a, a huge amount of work that we've all put into it, and, and it, uh, yeah, it feels amazing to have, to have come this, this far and to, to sort of be staring ahead and staring back with equal pride and excitement. It's awesome. Well, and who knew that we could get this sort of mileage out of a book starring Legion, who has sort of been like this D-list X-Men character? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, what a bizarre, a bizarre thing to have to have achieved, and, and to to still be standing here thinking this is this is great. There's still so much potential. I mean, it, it's it's so gratifying hearing people uh, saying, you know, you, you've made us care about this character that that really nobody gave much of a hell about before. So. So yeah, uh, a remarkable. Um, really pleased that uh, that I got this opportunity, and, and looking forward to carrying on. Um, so, in this issue in particular, uh, we run into the Red Skull. Um, mm-hmm. Is that a character that you've always wanted to write, or you just felt like he was perfect for this story? Um, what's the deal? Well, so um, as as most our readers will know, the Red Skull's featured predominantly uh, in. Uh, Uncanny at the moment. Uh, he stole the brain of Charles Xavier shortly after uh, the good professor perished. Um, so it felt like, well, all sorts of things. I mean, the first and foremost is that it felt like a really nice way of um, reassuring people that X Men Legacy, which, which uh, I mean, it, it's it, it sort of exists in in its own bubble of themes and and uh, tones and storylines, but it's still very much part of the Marvel universe. And so, we wanted to to fold in some of the big stuff that's going on elsewhere, just so that people know we're not we're not literally out on our own uh, in a place where none of the things that happen have any bearing because they absolutely do but more importantly I mean this is <laughs> it's a fantastic iconic uh, classic bad guy and and given a lot of the stuff we're playing with in legacy the the, the um, this this desire to kind of take the the, the expected route and, and subvert it to t- tilt things on their head and, and do things differently it's it's great fun to have a character who is characterized by being um, evil inside and out and and you can from that position that that kind of simple position you can do all sorts of really interesting and fun things and, and that's that's been what this little th- three episode arc uh, has really been all about uh, creating the impression that one thing's going to happen and then uh, flopping flopping it on its head and it happens more than once so yeah it's been really fun um, now Red Skull's turned up for a little bit in this issue and, and you know he's got you know a little bit of dialoguing does some stuff but um, but really you know you've gotten I, I feel like even deeper with some of these other characters who have shown up in the title um, I mean I, I think in particular of the uh, the priests of the Church of the Happy Host where you just really went there and pushed their language all the way, and it was so much fun. Um, are there any? Is there any character or characters uh, that you've really enjoyed writing? Yeah, I mean, I guess. Uh, I mean, we talked last time. I last time I spoke to you guys uh, for the for the AR thing. We we spoke about accents, and and I guess uh, sitting here in my office on my own, there's there's something. Uh, Something quite fun about if, if I'm writing ridiculous accents or really s- strong, thick accents, uh, which require me to speak the line of dialogue out loud, then, then uh, you, I mean, <laughs> you kind of get into it. You know, it feels like you're doing a little performance, and luckily there's nobody else in the house, so I can really let rip. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the the kind of deep south guys in the uh, in the church, the happy host, and all the the like. I mean, we we spoke before about uh, Pixie, for instance, and her. her really sick Welsh accent, which I'm really bad at, but have a lot of fun <laughs> trying to emulate. Um, so yeah, just the, the larger-than-life characters um, are always the most fun to write, but but I, I think part of what makes Legacy Legacy is that uh, it's the, the the quiet moments, the, the, the sort of subtle stuff, the nuancey stuff, which, which gives it 
that that different tilt than, than a lot of the other um, the other big X books out there. So so uh, yeah, I, I mean David himself is 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 kind of the most fun to write because he's such a, a sarcastic and yet very very. Um, heartfelt character to write you know you kind of have your cake and eat it when you're writing david um now speaking of quieter moments um blindfold Mm. um you know you approach david and blindfold with such you know it's, it's like this delicate nuance i mean it's really um i love how you write those two characters together and how you kind of let their relationship unfold and, and you know, twist and turn and, and all those things. Almost like, you know, a real relationship does, except that it's these two crazy, super powerful psychic mutants. Um, what, what is the, I guess, are you drawing upon anything from real life or otherwise for inspiration? Or, or what is it about their relationship in particular that I, I guess maybe just inspires you inherently? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, your thought process there. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's various things. I guess the the top line uh, for me was, I mean, it was always part of our intention that that David and Ruth be um, be forming this sort of um, romantic uh, circling one another scenario, which we've which we've been building up. So so part of that, uh, in dramatic terms, is that there has to be. There has to be an attraction, and there also has to be an obstacle. There has to be a reason that they don't just go, "Hey, all right, we're together now, and everything's great, and that's the end of the story. Let's start something else." And so, um, in a really soppy sort of way, um, my my idea is that each of them is 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 a, a broken person, and the other one, by being part of their life, fixes them. So it's two broken people who, by being together, are happen to be fixed, but uh, it's fixed in a way which can't can't persist. It's impossible to exist for long. It's like too too much, um, and and their their ideas, their their backgrounds are too different. So it's kind of this this constant cursed, but but really really lovely. Um, perpetual motion machine circling round and round and round each other and, and some of the stuff we're getting on towards in the next few issues I mean we're going to see how how that changes them we're going to see how it makes them feel towards other people around them but but yeah I mean it's 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 just it's a metaphor for, for first love isn't it we all remember the first time we fell in love and it's it's always the one that leaves the biggest imprint on your life and, and it may not be uh the, the best love of your life it may not be the biggest love of your life but it's the one you will uh you will feel has changed you the most in most cases and and that's that's kind of what we're doing here it's just told in the <laughs> told in the in, in the terms of uh, a pair of uber uber powerful sites i mean that changes the way that you're required to uh take something <laughs> In addition to Blindfold, uh, X-Men Legacy, you've kind of created this, I mean, heck of a supporting cast. Um, it's really funny because when we set out to tell a Legion story, I never really imagined that we would get, you know, uh, Japanese twins with psychic bird powers and, and that Frenzy and Chamber would play such a big role. Pixie, certainly, as you mentioned. Um, but I'm, I'm most intrigued by the, this gold fiend in, uh, in Legion's head, which is totally of your making. Uh, is... Where did he come from? Like, where, what was your inspiration for that character? Well, I, it's tricky to answer that without giving a few things away. So, um, uh, let me let me say for the record that I know exactly what he stroke it is, um, and and that will that will all be revealed. Um, but uh, in terms of in terms of how David is is obliged to deal with this thing. Um, well, for one thing, he's got he's got all these voices in his mind anyway, and so one more of them doesn't come as a surprise. Except that this one is clearly something a bit different, a bit special. The other personalities in David's brain seem to be afraid of it, um, and in fact, we learnt I think in in episode eleven, possibly uh, ten or eleven, that um, that the gold the gold skinned fiend has been uh, uh, preying upon other personalities in David's mind. Um, on top of that, the fact that it wears his father's face, the fact that it seems to have knowledge of his father, um, it's all adding up to this this really difficult picture in David's David's real mind, his subconscious, um, 
wherein he's he's kind of obliged to suspect that this really is the ghost of his father or some some aspect of his dead father um, I'm not going to say anything about whether it is or it isn't but that's that's a horrible thing for David to have to contemplate given the the confusing uh, emotions that he has regarding his father so yeah it's of, of all the things that could have appeared in his brain this is the one that's going to cause him the most headaches <laughs> wherein he's he's kind of obliged to suspect that this really is the ghost of his father or some some aspect of his dead father